Good morning. Welcome to First Congregation United Church of Christ of Lowell. We welcome you here and online. We are excited to have you worshiping with us. I am Shannon Hanley. I'm here with Pastor Alyssa Anton to worship this morning. I have several announcements to share, and I'm going to lead with an update regarding the Fallisburg Festival from last weekend. The numbers are not tallied, but we think we have uh, profited somewhere in the amount near $4,000. So we are excited about that. Today, we will have the uh, Black History Monthly Series that'll be in the conference room. We're talking about Freedom Denied, the Hope and D Disappointment of Reconstruction. That is, oh, I'm sorry, today it's from 6 to 8, but that's here in the conference room if you are interested in that. What? What? September 19th, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. September 19th. It was amazing if you were there. Um, I wasn't there. But anyway, something else is happening today. Book club. The Sum of Us. That's what it is. I got my announcements mixed up. If you've been reading The Sum of Us or you would like to even just join in on the discussion, we are meeting after church to discuss The Sum of Us. Okay. Sorry. You know, we do so many good things. All right, next week, the youth group has challenged all adults to a kickball tournament following worship at Fallsburg Park. So the adults think they can win. I'm impartial, uh, but following worship next week. So if you would like to witness this, if you would like to participate in this, we invite you out to Fallsburg Park following worship service. We're having a picnic and a kickball tournament. So bring a dish to pass. We would love to see you there. Uh, we are seeking a new church historian. It's been your lifelong dream to be a historian, I'm sure. So contact Pastor Alyssa if you are willing to help preserve our history for the generations to come. Coffee hour and other volunteer positions are available for sign up in the Family Center. It's fun getting back to somewhat more of a normal church life. So we are excited to have you sign up. I've already enjoyed the elevated treats we've been having since we've been back to that. So I'm excited for it. The little free pantry shelves have been slowly increasing this week. Um, they were, got filled up on Thursday and cleared out again. So there's definitely a need. If you are able to bring anything to donate to the little, little free pantry shelves, please do so. Know that Senior Neighbors is offering Tai Chi for seniors. Uh, this happens at Schneider Manor. The cost is $3 per person. The search committee to hire a second teaching pastor uh, is formed. That'll be Emily Elms, Lori Ingram, and Roland Hooks Bargain. I should have practiced. I'm sorry, Roland. Hawksbergen. <laughs> I'm sure no one has ever made that mistake. I apologize. But the search committee is open to hearing feedback or ideas about what we're looking for. On October 16th, we will have a churchwide listening session following worship to hear your thoughts as we begin interviewing people. So please, if you have anything to share, please let us know. We are also taking your ideas if you can think of someone who might be a good fit for that. At this time, we would invite anyone at home to put in the chat a greeting. If you are here in person, you may meet and greet those around you as you pass the peace of Christ. May God be with you. but not effectively safely. Okay. We'll talk about it. All right, at this time, we would join in a call to worship together as printed in the bulletin. 
Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. The Lord God reigns forever for all generations. Praise the Lord. We'll now sing hymn number 584. like to have some volunteers to come on up and give me a hand this morning. Dang it, I forgot something. Hang on one second. Sorry. We hold this, Felix. You can narrate. What if I put a lid on that? Would that be a better idea, Felix, you think? Yeah. A better idea? Don't look at it. Oh, you don't look at it, right? There's lots of tricks about not spilling stuff, right? Well, I put a lid on it, okay? Contained it. Mm -mm. But what if I want to, well, I'm not going to be able to spill it as much. I could still spill, right, but not as much. But what if I wanted to fill that? 
Just pour it in the top. Pour it in the top. Okay, Slowly. here we go. Slowly. Oh, fine. Well, that didn't work. You try it, Felix. Go for it. Go for it. Like, oh. Once we put the lid on, it was harder to spill. Or eat, yeah, harder to spill, but harder to fill, right? Okay, there's a lesson here for us. Look how much more delicate you need to be. Isn't this easier? Just fill it, right? Just fill it. Like, if you just fill it up, Felix, faster. Perfect, right? Easier with no lid on it, okay? Now, in our lives, in our faith, sometimes we say, oh, our pain is too much. Our joy is too much. We want to hold it. We don't want anything to spill over, right? We want to contain it. But that also means that we are not then open to opportunities for new stuff to go in, right? So our faith in God can maybe help us to put a bigger hole in our lid, to keep our lid off, to not look at it when we walk, right? Those things that help us not spill. The point is that with God, through prayer, through opportunities to work and serve God, we can let our hurt out, let our joy out, risk spilling, okay, because that also means we risk having our cups filled even more easily. Does that sort of make sense? You understand that we're like a cup, right? The more we can let come in, the more we can share out, right? We can spill love everywhere. And I'm glad CJ's not here to see that I spilled on the carpet, right? Will you guys join me in prayer? Dear God, thank you for making us your vessel. Thank you for showing us that even if we're hurting, even if we're sorrowful, when we have joy, we don't want to contain it. We want to keep ourselves open to opportunities, to new experience, to new ways to grow and serve you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today we will be reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, eight, verses 18 through chapter 9, verse 1. Too many eights and nines in there for me to keep, keep it straight. My joy is gone. My grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of my people I am hurt, I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I may weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen. This is obviously a passage of lament. I've said this before about reading through the prophets and these passages of lament always feeling particularly relevant. It's as if they have a special way of spanning space and time. 
What was relevant then is still unfortunately true today. They echo our loud cries of despair. And this lament passage is no different. Here, Jeremiah is lamenting for Judah, the people of Israel and their feelings of desertion by their God. And while that is awfully specific, even so, every generation can hear this lament of Jeremiah with new ears because desertion and suffering and separation spans centuries and cultures. So in order to discuss points of commonality between what was happening then and what is happening now, we have to figure out what was going on in this passage. While Jeremiah was still a very young prophet, Josiah was the king of the land of Judah, which housed the Israelites. Josiah was one of the better kings that reigned over Judah, and one of Josiah's first acts as king was to rebuild the temple, something that stirred up a sort of nationalism that was repressed during the occupation of other power-hungry kings. It renewed a sense of pride in their heritage for the Israelites, proud to identify themselves as Jews, a rekindling of their identity as God's chosen people. Josiah also launched a program of religious reform that was far-reaching, effective, and unifying. He rid the countrysides of idols that honored old deities and rooted out remnants of pagan worship. He closed shrines and places of local worship and invited clergy from outlying areas into Jerusalem to practice in the completely rebuilt temple. He reestablished a Jewish center of worship in Jerusalem one where the very presence of God was believed to dwell once again. No more outlying worship practices or influence of the political state. One unified Jewish religion focused on worship in the temple. And just as this began renewing a sense of hope in God's people, bridging a connection between God, the people, and their worship, Josiah was killed in battle and Jehoiakim took over. Jehoiakim did not value any of the reforms that Josiah had initiated, and in fact, he had a lackadaisical approach that may have actually made it worse. So that brings us right to this text. With their very last shred of hope dashed, the people are lamenting because they feel deserted by their God. But God hasn't deserted them. It is their own behavior that has them trapped. They have fallen for traps of idol worship and pagan practices. They've been sucked into the lie that power breeds wealth and success and well-being. They've bought into cheap grace, which is expecting God's protection and deliverance at no cost to them. They fail to see how their own actions may have brought them to this place. Sure, their circumstances suck the ones that are beyond their control. But that doesn't seem to push them to change the ones that are within their control. And no change, no correction in behavior, no rejection of these idols is what continues to keep them separated from God. So does that feel like any kind of commonality to what we might experience? We too are a people who might be holding on to just one last shred of hope, who perhaps are already feeling completely deserted, who feel no nearness to God, asking like, why would, a guy allow, why would God allow us to flounder in this pain and suffering? In truth, our own actions too have pushed us away from God and yet we wallow over what is beyond our control rather than taking ownership for what is. For example, anyone who has ever taken part in any kind of 12-step recovery program can attest to how hard it is to identify rationalization and excuses that perpetuate destructive behavior. This is true for any kind of addictive behavior, including any form of idolatry that we might be tempted to cling to the vices that entrap us and keep us away from knowing our creator. 
Wanting to change destructive behavior does not always produce the means to do so. Hence, why so many finally end up changing only after a rock bottom experience. And Judah is at a rock bottom experience in the wake of Josiah's death. One that I think we can identify with almost any time we turn on the news. In the wake of so many of our own tragedies, gun violence, overturning Roe v. Wade, the war in Ukraine, and that seems to be just what happened in this last month. Our desperation and our mourning is at a high. So there's some pretty heavy theology embedded in this passage that we need to examine because this text is an important point of no return for God's people. Some of those theological things we might talk about are the nature of human suffering, of brokenness, of reconciliation, and of grace. Of the choices that we are able to make and the, cho the ones that we cannot, the ones that have been made for us. This lament declares that the time has passed for healing and reconciliation, and now all that is known is brokenness. The text says that the harvest in summer would have been a good time for salvation, but it did not come. It is too late for redemption, for a miracle, for something that would change the outlook of the Israelites, and ultimately through the span of time and space, us. One of our ways of coping with the tragedies of today is to hold on to hope that second chances are right around the corner. North American Christian culture's optimism rehearses a narrative that presumes there is always a chance for a happy ending if we just act right. We can undo our communal brokenness, the circumstances of our world, if we can just do, say, and believe the right things, then we might have earned reconciliation. Or perhaps we adopt a version of cheap grace for our personal brokenness, in which we can do whatever we want as long as we just apologize afterwards. But is that really enough? Has that really ever changed anything for anyone? Have we seen that work anywhere in the world? Unfortunately, no. This hope, optimism, and cheap grace are in fact not enough. Because of what was happening right up until this text, and because the Israelites aren't showing any repentance, even in a moment of distinct hope that things might turn around, they still didn't change. So Jeremiah is lamenting that harvest and summer would have been a good time for salvation, but it did not come. So now, undoably, the brokenness is still very much with us. And if it was with Judah then, how much more so is it with us now? How many summers and harvests have passed with no happy ending in sight? No matter how many times we have repented, apologized, no matter how hard we try to act right, to just do and say and believe the right things, even in the midst of our culture's blind optimism, the brokenness is still with us. In fact, can't we examine how idolatries have become even stronger in our culture, further pulling us away from the relationship to God we ought to be able to have? Self-interest blinds people from the harm that is being done to others. Greed flourishes because insecurity reigns among us. And fear drives us into rigid defensive postures. These are the things that fail to, that help us fail to recognize our own role in turning away from God towards these preliminary concerns, blinds us to the plight it's causing for others. These are the forever idols that have replaced our God, and these are the idols that have led to collective tragedies and attacks on the human race. Despite our strong hope for a second chance, the reality of this brokenness seeps through almost every day. So that's the nature of brokenness and the choices that we make. But what about the nature of grace and the choices that God makes? Isn't it time now for some good news? 
For that, we have to ask one question. Who is lamenting in this passage? Is it Jeremiah? Is it God? Or is it the people? The answer really could be any of all those three, or perhaps all three. On the one hand, it is the people. God's beloved, vulnerable people far and wide in the land, crying out in anguish and suffering that is inclusive and expansive. It could be from generation to generation, all of God's people, any of them or any of us. That is true. On the one hand, verse 19 makes it clear, though, that God is the speaker, saying, why have they provoked me? God is crying out, wondering why people in their suffering are making slights against God. There was a communal culture of idolatry that was led by power-hungry kings and regimes, and the Israelites bought into that, despite their promises from God. So, of course, that created tension between God and the community. In fact, that relational, relational bond had deteriorated so much that repentance became impossible. So God's expressing anger. Why has God been provoked to the point of no return? Why would the people have done this to their God? It's idolatry that has created this disaster. So while on the one hand, the people are lamenting for their own suffering, God is also lamenting for the lost and broken relationships with God's creation. So now we know that it's probably both God and the people back and forth speaking out on their various concerns. But then we come across verse 21, which really causes some confusion around who is lamenting in this passage. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. So who suffers when people suffer is really the question. Is it the people? Well, yeah, obviously. Could it be the prophet Jeremiah? Presumably, sure. Or is it God? Hmm. Up until this point, we've essentially concluded that God is frustrated and fed up, no mercy remaining. But then we come across this. If the speaker is God, which I would argue it sounds like it is, then one could argue that when people suffer, God cannot thrive? Hmm. This is why seemingly useless semantics really matter theologically. Because if this is God speaking, then we can assume that when there is brokenness among the people, God is not at peace. That God laments over our brokenness. So if it is humans, of course we are grieved by our own condition, our own plight. And if it is the prophet, of course they are frustrated when people don't listen. But if it's God, well, then that changes everything. But what if, in a way, it's actually all three? That this verse contains God's words expressing a profound solidarity with people. It is us in our pain, but it is also God in solidarity with our own suffering. So perhaps if you are willing to take yourself here, this can be an explanation for the conditions of human suffering. That there is an unknown, incurable brokenness among us as people, one that spans generations of idolatry and separation from God. One that cannot be cured by a do-over. Summer and harvest have already passed. All that we can hope for as humans trudging through this broken world is reconciliation, a healing for the wounds we experience, a balm for the hurt that is inflicted upon us and our siblings, a hope for a different future than this. God mourns with us. God desires to reconcile, to seek forgiveness. This separation is not what God wants for creation, but The brokenness is with us regardless. Until we meet God in our final resting place, this is our reality. All we can strive for now is a bridge in the gap between ourselves and God. And 
rid ourselves of the idolatry that keeps us apart. So here's where grace enters in. Grace does not erase the truth of a world mirrored with pain and hurt. But it does lead me to believe that it is God speaking in verse 21. That God's act of mercy is giving an opportunity for reconciliation. The prophet doesn't know this grace and asks on behalf of the people, where is there a balm in Gilead? Is there healing for this hurt? And then the Gospel of John introduces grace by answering this question and says, yes, there is a balm in Gilead. There is a healing ointment offered to us by the grace of Jesus Christ. There is our assured confidence. So we are lucky to know this grace, to have a bridge that allows us to commune with our creator. But even so, it's important that we don't get caught up in a false positivity or a false assumption that that makes all good in the world. Because this text calls us right back to the importance of examining the ways in which idolatry keeps us separated from God. Because it is pervasive in our entire culture and will continue to span generations if we are inattentive to it. If we read this text and completely take away the brokenness that this passage describes because it makes us uncomfortable, then our interpretation robs this passage of its power. There is no balm in Gilead that will undo racism, genocide, war, poverty, capitalism, cancer, homelessness, insert any and all relevant tragedies, any way in which this human race is broken. There may be a healing offered to us now, but there will still be scars. There is reconciliation, but there is also brokenness that we cannot ignore. This is the tension in which we live, at least and until we meet God again. But now we know that our Creator grieves with us in the wake of all that separates us from Shalom. So there is no easy answer. There is no cheap grace for the healing of God's people. Jeremiah knows that for certain. He's asking for more capacity to grieve on behalf of those who have lost their lives to this painful separation from God, something we might want to do too. Lament is good and holy. Jeremiah is bidding us to pause for a moment to observe God's grief and God's love for the poor people of God. It would behoove us to do exactly that so that we don't become complacent in our place of optimism, hope, and grace. This text reveals to us that there is an intrinsic bond between ourselves and God. There is a linkage between what we feel and what God feels, what we want and what God wants. The difference is, of course, what we do and what God wants us to do. What might be the most theologically astute interpretation of this passage for us to answer who is speaking is that Jeremiah, as the prophet, is sympathizing with both God and the people, identifying the betrayal that God feels, but also understanding the pain and brokenness the people themselves feel. We, like Jeremiah, are positioned to sympathize with how difficult it is for people to change their ways, to rid themselves of idolatries we've become accustomed to, greed, fear, desire for power, and how burdensome it is for God to be separated from us. So, as prophets in our modern age, we talk a lot about speaking truth to power, but it is also a matter of speaking truth to suffering, to weakness, to laziness, to failure to take responsibility, and the list does not stop there. It takes encouraging our siblings to change behaviors and beliefs that are within their power to collectively address what isn't. We revel in grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation. But it's not cheap, so we shouldn't treat it that way. Instead, we do the work to rid ourselves of idolatry and we lament for the pain our siblings are experiencing. We are building a bridge 
while we carry the weight of generations worth of brokenness on our shoulders. It is labor intensive. It is exhausting. It feels rock bottomy. But then getting to the other side in unloading it at the feet of God and feeling the light and airy reprieve of grace is what makes it all worthwhile. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able. We will say the words of our church's mission statement together. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community in mind, body, and spirit. You may be seated and we will enjoy a musical reflection by Deborah. now let that reflection carry us right into a spirit of prayer one thing that we can do is within our power to address the brokenness we see all around us is to pray so that is what we will do this morning we will offer our concerns to God and we will ask God to lead us in how we ought to address it so with that let us pray and we will close together with the Lord's Prayer Answer us, O Lord, when we call on you, and show us your salvation. Hear our prayer, O Lord, our refuge and fortress, our God in whom we trust. We pray for those who are under siege from war or illness or any adversity. Give them faith and hope for the future that you are preparing. For those who live in fear of terror in the night or destruction in the day, be with them in trouble and satisfy them with long life. Mm. 
We pray for those who live in comfort and ease, satisfied with gluttony, drunk with power, wasting their days with idle pastimes. Show them the darkness of their ways and the end that is coming if they do not repent. We pray for those who are hungry or oppressed, those in prison or burdened by heavy labor, for the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant. Give them food and freedom, justice and joy. Watch over them and show them your welcome. Merciful God, we offer you these prayers and so many more unsaid in the confidence that you alone have the grace to receive us, the power to deliver us through Jesus Christ who has risen on our behalf and in whose name we now pray together. Our God, who is in heaven, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into this time of tithing and offering, I want to offer a reminder that this is an act of worship that is exactly that, one of the few actions you all actually get to take in this service. Typically, you're standing, you're sitting, you're responding, you're singing, but this is an action demonstrating worship, demonstrating your thanksgiving in, for all that God has given you. Part of the purpose of actually coming forward is to physically offer back to God all of those good gifts. And while many of us don't do that with technology, I still invite you to think on that, to think about this space and the service being an action on your part. And how might you instead utilize this time to really move yourself into what you will carry with you into this week. So Deborah will play for us, which is an opportunity for us to think and meditate upon that thought. We will then close together with the doxology and a prayer of dedication.
Please pray with me. We give you thanks and praise, generous God, for every good gift that comes from your hand. Make us rich in good works, generous and ready to share, taking hold of the life that really is life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, now I invite you to remain standing. We will turn to hymn number 591. This is my song. I love that reminder that all that we ask for is not just for ourselves, for our country, but truly on behalf of the whole human race, many of whom we know have it far worse than we do, and that we collectively share those concerns and act on their behalf. So with that, the work is great. I feel like I just, the work is heavy, but we will sing our common commission and empower us to go into our week to tackle the work anyway, because we know the reward is great and we know that it is our duty to do so. So with that, we will sing, we will go, we will eat treats, we will celebrate, and then we will go. to love and serve. We go in the name of Christ. Amen.